Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I've had a great visit so far. And please keep, please ask questions throughout. Uh, I'm sure it won't spoil my visit. I'm here to explain to you what we're doing in these large collaborations. So if there's any questions along the way, don't wait for the end. I, I will. <laughs> so if my responsible time is slow, I'll blame it on that. But <laughs> uh, in my talk, I will talk about the process, how we go from data from these enormous telescopes, like soon LCT, through hundreds of people, to beautiful constraints on cosmology. And uh, exciting times are starting for observational cosmologists. The 2020s will be, I think, the best decade for um, large cosmology surveys so far. We have uh, major progress in detector technology uh, and uh, immense telescopes being funded that will allow us to take um, unprecedented data sets of both the CMB. We can see here um, the approximate experimental, experimental sensitivity as a function of time, going from WMAP to soon CMB as four. Then uh, optical uh, surveys will take um, millions of spectrums of galaxies, mapping the um, geometry of the universe, uh, out to the time where dark energy um, becomes impo um, turns on. And uh, imaging surveys will uh, map billions of galaxies that allow us to constrain cosmology. And with um, these fantastic data sets coming along, we actually start out by asking a few simple questions. Namely, as observation cosmologists, we set out to measure a few parameters that uh, model our universe surprisingly well. Namely, we want to uh, measure the age of uh, the universe, the geometry of space, the density of atoms, the density of matter, the amplitude of fluctuations in both of these, and the scale depends of these fluctuations. Of course, then, details are not quite as simple, or we wouldn't be physicists, or, and we wouldn't be here. Uh, but that's the basic framework that we start with as observational uh, cosmologists. Even in this very simple picture, though, things get puzzling very quickly. You've probably all seen pie charts like this before, telling you that matter baryons as we know it makes about, up about 5% of the energy budget of the universe. Then another 25% of today's um, energy budget of the universe is in dark matter. Uh, I will not try to explain dark matter in this audience. Uh, your colleagues here know much more about it than I do. But uh, I'll just say that uh, it behaves gravitationally like matter, so it inter interacts gravitationally but it's invisible. So we have multiple lines of evidence uh, that it exists, makes galaxies stable, and we also need it uh, for the universe to work on large scales. In addition to that, there's another about 70% that we've called dark energy, though mysterious maybe stuff might be a more a fitting description up to now. This um, dark energy um, has been introduced to explain the observed accelerated expansion of the universe. Uh, that uh, has been measured by supernovae since the late 1990s. So we have multiple lines of measurements uh, for the existence of dark energy by now. Our goal for the next decade is to understand what is this uh, mysterious force driving the expansion of the, the, driving the accelerated expansion of the universe. Is it a cosmological constant, which would be characterized by an equation of state uh, p over rho of exactly minus one? That would be theoretically the mo easiest explanation in that it fits uh, the most naturally uh, in the context of general relativity. Though even then, the theory and observations dis disagree by 120 orders of magnitude, which is hardly precision cosmology. Uh, beyond that, there's many possible uh, models. Saul Permuter, one of the people getting a Nobel Prize for detecting this accelerated expansion, has estimated that there's about a new model for dark energy on the archive a day since uh, it has been measured. So it tells you theory space is enormous. Starts out with um, dynamic scalar fields, so giving this uh, equation of state W a time dependence as the theoretically simplest um, extensions. And then moving on from there, people have thought of all kinds of clever ways uh, to break GR. This is enormous theory space, and it would be rather futile to try to confront uh, model by model with data. So instead, we often ask aggregate questions. Namely, we start uh, by testing whether data from the early universe and the late universe can be fit by the same parameters in our simple model, whether measurements of um, the expansion history and the growth of structure agree. 
I'll get to that in a few slides. And whether this uh, equation of state uh, change, uh, changes as space expands. So those are our three uh, relatively simple measurements that we focus on and uh, that then allows us to uh, test the simplest lambda CDM model of dark energy and hopefully rule out uh, some of the more complicated modified gravity scenarios. So let's start with measurements uh, of the expansion history for which we compare distance and redshift. And these measurements come in two forms, standard candles, so this brightness, uh, uh, we use the brightness of a source with known lum luminosity to infer distance. Typically we do this uh, with um, supernovae, where the luminosity can be determined from duration and color. Uh, up here you see a nice compilation of the um, apparent brightness um, of supernovae from the joint light curve analysis compilation. Low redshift over here, high redshift, distant ones over here, over there. You see, you see the dimming, the theory line looks great. Um, doesn't tell you much uh, in that plot, but the important thing here is that this theory line is based on parameters that we fit to the CMB. So these are parameters determined when the universe was uh, a few hundred thousand years old, uh, and then fit to a supernovae at redshift one and below. And the residual down here tells you that um, this expansion uh, in the limit of this one measurement of expansion history, yes, data from the late universe and the early universe can be fit by the same parameters within our simplest model. Our other expansion, main expansion uh, history measurement are standard rulers, where we use the angles subtended by a known scale. That typically is uh, the sound horizon, which is imprinted uh, in the early universe at the time of the, um, of, uh, the CMB, so when the universe was about 40,000 years old. And uh, this physics is then also imprinted uh, in the distribution of galaxies in form of the bari baryonic acoustic oscillation feature, um, which is the same scale, but it, it has evolved for billions of years. And uh, this plot here shows you a comparison of the measured um, BEO scale compared to the prediction, again, using the parameters fit um, to the early universe. And within current error bars, you can see that, again, early and late universe agree well within the lambda CMB model for this measurement uh, of the expansion history. So together, these measurements um, are consistent and the tightly constrained that our universe is um, close to flat and, um, and also give important concerns on the, metadom on the meta density. However, expansion history is not all that we can do to constrain cosmic acceleration or possibly modified gravity. Our other uh, main window at uh, constraining dark energy or whatever it may be is cosmic structure formation. But the idea is that stru structures in the universe grow through gravity, um, while dark energy slows down this growth of structure. On uh, very large scales, we can of course do this in perturbation theory. That gives us the growth factor, one of our key measurements, but there's much richer information on small scales. So uh, these, pl these plots here show you the um, dark matter distribution from a simulation from early times to evolve to late times showing you uh, how, how the cosmic web forms. And the important point here is that this white scale here, that's um, about the scale of our standard ruler, things above that uh, are fairly uh, well in the limit of perturbation theory. So uh, we can use the information scales larger than that without detailed knowledge uh, of small scale physics. But you can also see from these plots that there is a lot of information on scales smaller than uh, 120 megaparsec. So for the best uh, constraints on dark energy and modified gravity, of course, we want to um, turn to those smaller scales as well. For that, we usually have to rely on numerical simulations that allow us to reliably predict the dark matter distribution for select dark energy scenarios um, and some modified gravity models, but one model at a time. So we can do perturbation theory for pr pr pretty much most um, modified gravity and dark energy scenarios. If we want to use small scales, we have to turn to simulations, and those solvers can become very difficult uh, if you break GI in a complicated way. So that's the basic effect that we uh, want to uh, use to constrain dark energy. Now let's talk about the other part of the story. At the end, we want to end with beautiful contours like this. And we, we of course, start out with data coming from a telescope. In the past, 
or also until recently, a collaboration could go, reduce this uh, data, make maps and catalogs. Those are released, released to the web. And any theorist or phenomenologist can come along, download those uh, products, return into constraints. In my talk, I'm going to explain to you why this is, uh, will be more complicated in the area of precision cosmology. And uh, I think our working model at that point will be that uh, for instead of simply saying we do data reduction, we have to be specific saying, OK, there's foreground removal. We have to classify stars and galaxies. We have to estimate galaxy shapes. Um, the photometric calibration will be very important. We have to specify how we find galaxy clusters how we detect supernovae uh, and uh, fit the light curve. And all this will now be interconnected with the model building on the theory side, uh, exactly because our measurements are, are becoming so uh, precise. So you can notice that I no longer have a black box around the telescope. Instead, this directly goes through hundreds of people uh, to the constraints and uh, simply working on the final data products without revisiting a systematics will probably not work for, um, for fancy model building. So our process for connecting data and theory then becomes that we have a cosmological model, choose some parameters, generate initial conditions, and evolve it to get the black matter distribution as a function of time. And then the first piece of magic happens. That's basically all of astrophysics to turn this um, map of the matter um, to um, the distribution of light in galaxies. And then at that point, statistical metric has to happen because we have to uh, compare this distribution of galaxies to our observational data. There are um, some brave groups right now working on how to directly compare um, um, a catalog obtained from a survey to numerical simulations and how to um, build a forward modeling machinery to turn that into cosmological constraints. But for today, I will talk you through the current mainstream pro process that is, we will apply summary statistics um, to our galaxy distribution and then compare that to theory. So the workhorse for this so far has been the two-point correlation function, uh, which is the axis probability of uh, finding a galaxy pair as a function of separation over a random distribution. The beauty is that uh, this two-point correlation function uh, is relatively simply related to the matter power spectrum, assuming that we know how light relates to matter. And then we have uh, one of the favorites of most theorists, the meta power spectrum, uh, that on very large uh, spatial scales, so small wave modes over here, gives us uh, the linear growth factor we can calculate from perturbation theory. So that's the change in amplitude here from matrix two to one to zero. Over here, these wiggles are our standard ruler, the baryonic, baryonic acoustic oscillations. So that's encoded in there. And then down here, all of that is nonlinear structure formation. If we are somewhat more ambitious, we can, of course, um, go on with our summary statistics. For example, uh, we can count uh, the biggest overdensities in the cosmic web, galaxy clusters, and relate that to the distribution of peaks in the early universe. Um, complementary to that, we can also study the underdensities, that's cosmic voids, which are dominated by um, dark energy the earliest, and which are, in some sense, also easiest to model, because it's underdensities and more linear. And then if we want to be really ambitious um, and slightly masochistic, we can also return to triplets of galaxies and study triangle configurations in the sky. As you can imagine, there's a lot of triangles in the sky. Uh, so this is still a, a rather futuristic analysis, which I will not focus on for today. But uh, overall, the goal is to compress the huge catalog of galaxies into a, a relatively small number of summary statistics and then compare that to theory models. In addition to uh, just the galaxy distribution, we need um, some more physics, that is gravitational lensing, which is simply the fact that uh, energy uh, bends space-time and that tells light how to move. So uh, let's imagine we have a big overdensity here and light um, being emitted from a galaxy in the background. As, that, uh, as, that, as this light travels through the cosmos, over densities uh, keep deflecting it, uh, and um, it arrives um, in our telescopes distorted compared to the um, shape that it was originally in. 
You may have seen these beautiful images of um, arcs around massive galaxy clusters. That, that is the strong version of this effect. I will focus today on the weak uh, large scale structure limit of it, that is weak lensing. We have here um, a simulation that exaggerated the effect of weak lensing by about a factor 100. So in that limit, you can now see that these nice high end galaxies that were, were assumed to be circular in the input um, start to align tangentially with filaments. In reality, of course, this effect is about a factor 100 weaker. Our background galaxies are not cyan against a, against a differently colored uh, background. And they are also fuzzy blobs, often in the signal to noise about, of about 20. They are also elliptical and have their own intrinsic orientations. So you can imagine that this is a challenging statistic measurement. But um, I will show you um, some initial results that show how promising of a cosmological me measurement this is. So then we measure the shape of each of these galaxies an average over hundreds of them in a nearby patch of the sky um, so that the, the intrinsic orientation averages out. And the only signal we keep after averaging over the int uh, intrinsic orientations is that distortion uh, imprinted um, by the tidal field um, where, of course, nearby galaxies, the light from nearby galaxies went through the same tidal field. So at high signal to noise, our process then is that we have uh, an intrinsic galaxy of unknown shape, which gets sheared, here again exaggerated by about a factor 100. Then that sheared galaxy goes through the atmosphere and a telescope, blurring it. It gets pixelized in a detector, and then there is um, noise on top. Typically, this is at a signal to noise of about 25. So what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Obviously, quite a lot. Um, but we put in some parameters um, to account for the uncertainty in this mapping between um, galaxy shape and shear that was applied to the galaxy. These are called shear calibration parameters, which I'll come back to uh, later in this talk. So those will capture the various effects of what could go wrong in this uh, process of um, estimating shear based on these galaxy shapes. And just um, as a warning, I must say, when I transitioned from a PhD um, in perturbation theory to observations, seeing raw data from the dark energy uh, survey came as a shock to me. The, the galaxies for which we measure um, weak lensing are the tiniest, tiniest blobs in this uh, image, and you can't see most of them by eye um, on this screen uh, in this low resolution version of the image. So we're really talking about the tiniest galaxies uh, in this image. This sounds like a um, challenging measurement, and it is. But fortunately, um, nature has built in a consistency test. We can measure the same effect in a different way. That is, we can also measure the lensing effect on the cosmic microwave background. So here we use the uh, primordial CMB as a backlight, and the lensing effect uh, by the light structure is the same. But now for our measurement, we use that this background field here is a random Gaussian field. And uh, lensing then um, introduces non gaussianities that is higher order correlation functions. And we can use these um, d deviations from a um, Gaussian random field in the observed temperature field and polarization to reconstruct um, uh, the deflection field. And we can then compare that to our measurements of the same effect with galaxies. <coughs> so those are a bunch of different ways of probing cosmic structure. You've probably all seen um, these nice uh, summary plots of cosmology before, where you see here uh, the constraint on matter and dark energy from baryonic acoustic oscillations, our standard ruler, from the CMB and from supernovae. And then people have uh, nicely combined the posteriors from these individual measurements, resulting in a nice combined gray constraint. That works beautifully in this particular case, where the different measurements are uncorrelated. So anyone can take the results from those three collaborations. But when we now talk about combining different measurements of the large scale structure, uh, in, in addition from the same survey, things become more complicated. Namely, we use galaxy clustering, the two-point correlation function, galaxy clusters, the big peaks, and weak lensing to measure the same underlying density field. So these measurements are inherently correlated. And then they come from the same survey and are affected by the same astrophysics. 
so there will also be correlated systematic effects. So instead of simply combining posteriors here, we actually have to go to a full joint analysis. Each of the parts in this uh, slide is the work of probably 20 plus people in each of these cervical regions. So I can't do any of this justice. I just want to show you how the different pieces fit together today. And I'd be happy to talk about um, the individual ingredients afterwards and point you to people who know more than I about probably each of these. So uh, our joint analysis starts by defining a science case. That means we have to define our parameters of interest. What uh, dark energy model or dark matter model or whatever do we want to constrain? Then of course we have to ask ourselves for which measurements and on which scales can we model this? That determines here our data vector, d hat. Then we will probably impose a prior from um, previous experiments on some of these parameters. And then it gets really interesting. So we need a likelihood function, which for now we often assume to just be a multivariate Gaussian, mostly because we haven't had time to go beyond that. But a lot of work has to happen um, for this to adapt um, to the reality of the mid 2020s. This is the likelihood of our um, observed data um, and um, our model, where now our model data vector contains not only our parameters of interest, but a large number of nuisance parameters that are supposed to capture systematics. This is what most of my talk will be about. Then we also need a covariance because all these different, uh, different measurements are intrinsically correlated. That's what I mostly work on, but I've learned that four point functions um, don't make for good conversation topics. So I'll just skip over that and say that we have a full perturbative model how all this is um, correlated. And again, I can talk to you later, but that's not worry about it for this talk. Then I think the most interesting astrophysics and science happens in terms of getting to know our nuisance parameters. It is clear that our systematic effects will by far outnumber the number of cosmology parameters. So we have to figure out how to um, prioritize this huge space. And I'll show you my uh, game plan for that in the following slides. But throughout this talk, please remember from slide two that we are after six or seven parameters. And then of course, we will need external simulations to validate all our assumptions about um, astrophysics that goes into this cosmology analysis. And I had said before that we want to do precision cosmology, where you could say, okay, we are in a situation right now where all our measurements are somewhat scattered and we already know that there will be big surveys in our future, so, you, so the error bars will shrink. If we only get precision, it could happen that our error bars shrink, but we are off center, so precision is not enough. Um, instead of precision cosmology, we actually need precise and accurate uh, cosmology, so that um, at the end, all our measurements hopefully converge on the truth, which of course comes with the additional uh, problem that we don't know the bull's eye of the universe. So I'll also talk about that aspect later. But generally we can say that accuracy comes at the cost of complex analyses and more astrophysics. So briefly, uh, precision cosmology means excellent sy statistics and systematics limited, which really means that we are person power and creativity limited. Uh, it is of course very easy to come up with a large list of potential systematics and nuisance parameters. And we did this game in the dark energy survey in 2013 before we had data. I talked to each of the working groups. For the experts in the audience, you can read my list. Probably none of these parameters are surprising. A lot of this, a lot of this is about characterizing the relationship between light and dark matter, galaxy bias, and photometric redshift uncertainties. My key point here is that our initial list had about 500 to 1,000 parameters. And remember, we want to measure maybe six. So this is not a good spot to be in. Self-calibrating, marginalizing all of these can be computationally costly, uh, with poor algorithm it could take forever, and we also might lose constraining power that, is, that we uh, actually didn't need to lose. So this is highly suboptimal. So before I talk about uh, our recent analysis, let me briefly put the DES year one data analysis, shown as this uh, red um, square here, in the context of recent and upcoming cosmology surveys. 
where here I show you um, survey completion um, year. That's of course approximate. The area of each of these uh, squares tells you the um, survey area on the sky. And up here I illustrate the galaxy density. So back in 2009, the Canada France Hawaii Telescope Legacy Survey completed observations of 150 square degrees with about 11 galaxies per square arc minute. So then it still took another, I guess, seven or eight years to complete the weak lensing analysis of that because it is a, it is a challenging measurement. But that really put uh, weak lensing on the map of um, survey cosmology. Right now we have three friendly competitors, the Kilo, Kilo Degree Survey, the Dark Energy Survey, and Hyper Supreme Cam on Subaru, which will all have roughly similar constraining power, but following slightly different survey strategies. So going to a higher depth and smaller area means that um, HSC is more sensitive to early time phenomena, while large area helps to put uh, best constraints on the fairly late universe. But all these surveys, which will end up doing cosmologies of order 100, 200 million galaxies, are really a training ground for the billions of galaxies that will come to our hard drives in the mid-2020s, when we will have um, the ground-based large synoptic survey telescope surveying half of the sky, and then two different space-based te space telescopes, UK and W first, which again follow very different um, survey and systematic calibration strategies. But for now, let me talk about year one of the Dark Energy Survey. But yes? Uh, because of integration time. So if we, look if we, if we have a bigger telescope uh, and uh, observe for longer, we go to greater depths, and then you uh, approximately um, optimize um, or you uh, make different choices of how you prioritize going deep versus going wide. And when I talk about DSU1 results, there really should be about 400 people standing here talking to you because this was truly a team effort. Uh, this is only a small group, basically those who were still awake enough at the end of a recent collaboration meeting to show up for the picture. But doing this cosmology analysis really took the skills of, over the time, probably 600 to 700 people, uh, starting from building the camera to detailed data reduction to, at the end, cosmology inference. And the work would not have been possible with just a small team. So think of them as I tell you about our results right now. But on from people to galaxies, in our year one analysis, we use two different galaxy samples. Uh, one here on the, on the left uh, is a sample of red sequence galaxies. They're called red magic, where the magic part is the uh, redshift calibration. Because this is a red sequence template fitting algorithm, we get about percent level um, redshift accuracy from a phot photometric survey, which is really important for resolving structure along the line of sight. So we use these galaxies these 600,000 galaxies split in five tomography bins to measure galaxy clustering. And then we also have about 26 million galaxies at signal to noise about 20 and above for which we measure galaxy shapes. And those are then our weak lensing samples. From these two galaxy samples, we first of all measure the uh, cross correlation of galaxy positions. That's our angular clustering. Uh, we measure the cross-correlation between galaxy positions and weak lensing, and uh, that measures the uh, typical masses of halos, and is a probe of the large-scale matter power spectrum. And we measure the cross-correlation of two galaxy shapes, that is co cosmic shear, a pure weak, weak lensing measurement that does not require any assumptions about the relation between matter and light. We only need galaxy bias, the relation between matter and light for this map. We have three different correlation functions subject to different systematics. And now we have data, things get real. I told you about our laundry list of 500,000 parameters. After intense discussion, we ended up throwing uh, away a lot of signal to noise in order to arrive um, at angular scales that we can model with a very simil simple model. But when I say simple, I must say this is still many more parameters than any other uh, survey of this kind has done before. But uh, we arrive at uh, uh, parameterizing the relation between matter and light with just linear galaxy bias per redshift bin. We have one simple shift parameter for photometric redshifts uh, per sample and redshift bin. Uh, we have these uh, multiplicative shear calibration uh, parameters per bin that uh, allow for uncertainties in the mapping from 
galaxy shape to um, weak lensing effect. And we have a parametric model that accounts for the fact that the background shape, the intrinsic shapes of galaxies are not random, but also influenced by the tidal field, which is just the lensing. That's called intrinsic alignment. So that gives us 20 parameters. Of course, this list is known to be incomplete. There's a lot of astrophysics that we know about, such as baryons. That's not accounted in our systematics model. Uh, so we did a lot of validation tests uh, to figure out which data points we can use without being too um, worried about, say, baryonic effects. And you can read all that um, in a detailed paper, but again, I don't think it makes good conversation topics. Similarly, all these parameters up there are our choice for parameterization. This is not a statement about the universal truth that the, gal that the universe really gives us galaxies that have one linear bias parameter per redshift bin. So we also check uh, in detailed simulated analyses that these parameterizations are sufficiently flexible. And then we put out that paper describing our systematics model before we um, look at, at um, the answer we got. Because another very important uh, ingredient in our analysis was um, blinding. So we are a big collaboration, and people might have different wishes for the outcome of our analysis. Some people uh, might want to see cosmic consistency, everything works great. That is, uh, they hope to find that the late universe and the cosmic microwave background are described by the same parameters. Then others, for example, if you're on the job market, might hope for a more flashy result. And we certainly don't want the louder fraction of those two to win. So we put in some safety measures. That is, we uh, blinded our analysis to the cosmology values. Until we all agreed to open the box, we did not know what values of omega, meta, and sigma 8 we got. For example, um, half a year before we opened the box, I was giving a bunch of job talks showing omega, meta, sigma 8 being centered on minus 1, minus 1, which led some people to question my fundamental understanding of cosmology. <laughs> but this was to uh, remind everybody in the collaboration these parameters don't mean anything yet. You could see shifts. So if you tweak the analysis, uh, the parameters could move away from minus one, minus one by, uh, by a bit. And that told you that you found a knob in the analysis that mattered for our result. But you didn't know where we were with, with respect to other experiments. And um, it turns out blinding these type of large structure measurements is it's, it's much more difficult than in particle physics, where you typically have a signal region and background around it that you can use to um, figure out um, much of your systematic strategy. But in the case of um, the meta power spectrum, most of our systematics are directly convoluted with um, this quantity we want to measure. That is, astrophysics directly affects the meta power spectrum in 3D on all scales before we uh, get to our correlation functions. We can't simply exclude something and say, OK, we calibrate our backgrounds, background from this part of the data. Also, we need to be able to look at the data to do null tests, for example, to figure out whether there's an imprint of the chip gap into our correlation functions. That means that at the end, we arrived at a two-stage blinding process where the galaxy shapes were multiplied by an unknown factor um, until all the choices about the catalog was fixed. After we exactly knew these are our 26 million galaxies, we then took out this unknown factor so that people could look at consistency of weak lensing and galaxy clustering. But the cosmology parameters were still blinded. We also agreed not to overplot measurement in theory until we opened the box, and that we have to stay, clearly state any post-unblinding changes in the paper to hold ourselves accountable. And in a few weeks, you will see a DS paper on the archive that takes uh, with clearly state any post-unblinding changes uh, in the paper to the extreme. But for this analysis, it worked beautifully. We opened the box. And uh, this green and red contour are to our two independent slices of, it, of the data. Green is weak lensing only. And then the red contour is uh, galaxy clustering and the cross-correlation between galaxy clustering and weak lensing, projected here on the constraint of the matter density and the amplitude of structure growth. And the important part, of course, here is I only show two parameters but this is marginalized over all of cosmology and all the nuisance parameters I told you about. So this shows you how well our mo model worked, that we were able to consistently predict these three different correlation functions. 
And because we found after a bunch of statistics tests that these two contours are consistent, which is kind of obvious in this projection, we decided we could combine them. And these blue results here are our DSU1 cosmology result. Then, of course, the question comes back to um, confronting this with um, the uh, cosmic microwave background. So just for some sense of scale here, we are now comparing cosmology parameters derived from the matter distribution at uh, redshift a half or so, and density contrast much larger than one in many cases, to um, cosmology parameters derived from the uh, CMB temperature at redshift about uh, 1,100, when the density contrast was um, of order 10 to the minus 4 and less. So that's the game we're playing, and we're asking, can we describe both of these with the same parameters? Here is part of that answer. That is a, a projection, again, into our meta-density structure, amplitude structure growth parameter space. DES combined, again, in blue. And these green contours here are Planck, um, TT plus low P, for those who care. So excluding CMB lensing to really isolate uh, the contrast between early and late universe. And the question whether they agree or not may in part depend on whether you're a particle physicist or not, and who have very different standards for tension than astronomers. In this prediction, it looks like um, the two, two sigma contours vaguely touch. It's unclear what to make of that. We also learned after unblinding that we don't know enough about stati um, statistics, um, or we did not carefully think about statistics enough to really um, assess whether these two distributions agree in the full parameter space. And how to really quantify tension or agreement is currently a huge topic of debate. So stay tuned. The statistical tools will get improve. And we are currently also analyzing many more galaxies uh, to narrow those contours. But of course, the S is not the only big lensing survey. Um, here's a nice comp compilation from the um, um, Hyper Prime Cam survey uh, team in this paper by um, Hikago and Oguri from 2019, showing you the constraints from, from the Subaru telescopic lensing, DES, and the kilo degree survey. So three different uh, telescopes, different survey strategies, completely independent teams, different algorithms, and different modeling choices. And um, while not all the um, detailed differences between the three weak lensing surveys um, are resolved yet, you can see that all these weak lensing measurements currently fall on the same side of the uh, cosmic microwave uh, background constraint in blue. So this is certainly in intriguing. Yeah? They probably don't, but um, we are still working on some of the modeling tools for consistently combining them. It is difficult to, to combine these uh, different patches on the sky. Yes. Since this um, is now shown in um, S8, which also includes is basically sigma 8, uh, uh, depends on sigma 8 and omega meta, I can't tell you directly. And I would have to repeat the analysis uh, in, in a different um, prior space. But yes, there's definitely many things that we should still have to look into. And then, of course, each survey is doing more work to improve constraints on the DES side. We're currently repeating this, this analysis here with about a factor of five times more galaxies. And we hope to finish that this winter. So these contours sh should shrink, shrink by almost a factor two. And things uh, may get exciting or really boring, depending on how you look at it. And then, of course, we will also include uh, more different measurements from within DES in our combined analysis. So we are definitely uh, busy in collaboration. But let me talk more about the somewhat more distant future for the rest of this talk. That is um, why we are working so hard on LSSD, W first and Euclid right now. And uh, I would like to point out again, this year is survey completion year, but it gets interesting much more before that. LSSD is getting real. 
This is what the summit looked like uh, a few months ago. And we're scheduled uh, to start the survey in 2022. And the first year of data will already be immensely powerful. If we are mostly interested in the nearby universe, which is dominated by dark energy, then um, the most impressive gains will be from early data rather than going from year nine to year 10. So 2022, 2023 is when most of the action will happen there. Fortunately, there's already about 700 or 800 people of us working on it. Um, we are currently preparing to carry out a cosmology analysis with the LST survey, organized in six cosmology working groups, um, galaxy clustering, galaxy clusters, strong lensing, supernova weak lensing, and an Ethereum joint probes group, putting all these different measurements together, and a large number of additional working groups that uh, simulate both cosmology and the LCD system in great detail, so that we will hopefully understand many of the imaging effects, sensor um, artifacts, and also um, how to deal with photometric calibration, everything, as soon as we get data. Of course, that's somewhat wishful thinking, but being prepared for the systematics that we already know about is probably the best strategy to be pre prepared for unknowns. So there's plenty of work to do. If you're at all interested uh, in LSST, come and join us. It's open to anyone in the US. Here's the brief motivation for doing all of this work. This is constraints on the dark energy equation of state, and it's um, time, it time dependence on the y-axis from first individual probes, galaxy clustering in yellow, cosmic shear in red, galaxy clusters in blue, and then the green contours are doing the equivalent of the DES analysis, and black is combining all of them. So if we are able to put them all together, our constraints on the dark energy equation of state will be phenomenal. Currently, this is uh, in incorporating of all the 50 Newton's parameters, but we, of course, still have to do, invest as much creativity as we can um, to optimize that space. So let's talk about survey optimization, uh, which uh, in the first cartoon, one might think that having more galaxies is good. Definitely. It gets, more, when you bring in survey area, it gets more complicated than that, uh, where we've, of course, obviously having as many galaxies as possible and as much area as possible is really good. And then we're currently finding, at least for dark energy, going wide first before going deep is more optimal, but that depends on your science case. This is, of course, still just um, the statistics of our observations. If we then go to stage three of survey of, yes? It is more fundamental, but uh, cartoons don't always need to be fundamental. <laughs> yeah. You, you design a survey based on depth, not number density of galaxies, because number density is one of the parameters. Yes. Sure. But uh, in terms of just illustrating here where we want to put our galaxies, let me just say putting them wide rather than deep. Um, for a dark energy is more optimal. If we then go to um, stage three of survey optimization, um, I draw it like this. Area, number density of galaxies, the two axes you knew before, and then this will be some hyperdimensional space, including optimizing how well we can calibrate the shear of each galaxy, how well we can calibrate photo uh, and all these other complications. I don't need to go through them one by one right now, my main point is that um, even though it's a complex space, it's pretty clear all of that is uh, orthogonal to a survey cost. So somehow we have to find a compromise. Let me just skip this. So we want to prepare for known systematics in order to get the best possible answer from our survey at finite cost. And for that we might ask what's the do dominant known systematic? Well, unfortunately there's no one fits all answer. We need to be more specific. That is, we, we go back to uh, specifying in detail what our data vector is and our parameters of interest. Then we write our big laundry list and figure out which of those parameters actually matter. So let me put that uh, in a few cartoons. Right now for LCC we are in a situation where we don't have data, but we know that at the end we want um, the best possible parameter constraints. So we want precision, small error bars, 
uh, and we want accuracy, and we will find, get to accuracy by requiring consistency between different measurements. These two will only be possible once we have data, but right now we can optimize for precision. That is, we forecast for each uh, parameter on our list how important is it. Let me uh, show you that in a cartoon. This would be a theoristic dreamland. Someone hands us data, we analyze it, and we um, measure the truth with small error bars. If then this data contained a systematic that we didn't know about, uh, our um, constraints would be biased. Then we think about it and realize, ah, I, I forgot the following systematic, put it in and measures over it. Tada, we uh, get our true cosmology again, but at a price of increased error bars. If now we find that this um, loss of constraining power is large, then it's time to g get really creative and think about how to externally calibrate the systematic. That is, we, if it's baryons, for example, we might go look at TSD measurements, figure out uh, parameters for feedback, and importantly then, we can put priors in our analysis that allow us to reduce this loss of constraining power. And we will do the, of course, now we're going through all these parameters one by one. One um, aspect that I would like to highlight here is that, of course, we want to do fundamental physics from galaxies. And galaxy evolution is very rich compared to the primary CMB. So we probably want to know a lot about galaxies. And one aspect that I want to highlight here is galaxy bias, that is the relation between galaxy populations and meta distribution. <coughs> here is a forecast um, how well we can constrain dark energy if we use large scales only. So knowing how halos cluster without caring about what galaxies do within halos. Uh, that's approximately this family of, of constraints. The numbers don't matter right now. Nobody trusts the forecast anyway. But qualitatively can say that if we understand how to model also the clustering of galaxies within halos, then we can um, drastically improve our constraining power by about a factor of um, four. That corresponds to two full sky um, LSST with large scales only. And since two full sky surveys are very futuristic, um, I think uh, understanding the small scale classic of galaxies is an important priority. Realistically, after putting in complex um, systematic marginalization, we will probably um, end up in a situation like this, where we approximately recover the input cosmology, but with some residual bias, and it increases uh, uncertainty. And we won't fully know that beforehand, because of course we won't know the full true systematics model of the universe. But we can do our best right now to pre prepare for it. And then we get data and use our by now optimized systematics code, <coughs> systematics model and analysis code to analyze each of those probes to look for consistency. So we might end up in a situation like this as our first pass. At this point, it gets really interesting. We have to ask ourselves, did we just detect new physics or just unknown systematics? And uh, I'm sure that's the question that many of us will be asking in, in about 2023. Fortunately, there is a few things that we can directly test. For example, we can ask, does the bias between different measurements decrease if we restrict to scales so that we understand better? That would probably hint at a problem with our nonlinear modeling. We can ask whether the offsets depend on the galaxy or cluster selection. We can always calibrate with more accurate measurements. That is, we can cal uh, calibrate photoses with spectroscopic redshifts. Uh, we can turn to X-rays or low scatter um, mass proxy for clusters detected through optical richness. We can galaxy shapes from space phase imaging. I show you here a comparison of galaxy um, decomposition from Subaru imaging, which is probably the closest we have to LSST, and from space. And you can see that uh, Assigning galaxies, identifying galaxies and fitting shapes is a messy endeavor at, at, those, um, um, at that depth. So we can do all of this, but it's potentially expensive. So we uh, cannot do all of that completely. And we find, have to find a compromise, just trying to figure out what the unknown systematic is. So then another avenue that I find very fun is that we can also correlate with other um, surveys. And that's where the CMB lensing comes back in. I told you about m measuring the lensing from galaxies and from the cosmic microwave background. Here we did a forecast how well we can constrain 
these um, parameters in the shear mapping or shear calibration by cross-correlating LSST and CMB as four. These are different slicings of the data. Doesn't matter so much for now. My main point is that if we combine uh, LST weak lensing and CMB lensing from CMB as four, we can um, constrain the uncertainty in the shapes of high redshift galaxies. We show the mean redshift up here to um, half a percent, which is better than the LST requirement. That's especially interesting because of course, high redshift galaxies are the most complicated. But this is just one example for how we can use cross correlations with different surveys that measure the same effect, but with different uh, systematics to calibrate systematics in the end. And then of course, as we go through um, all these steps, you should keep in mind, are we biased? Uh, if we knew that the Planck best fit was over here, would that change our approach of thinking about which of these measurements we trust uh, and which ones we don't? And should, it, should that be the case? So that means that we might also want to put in blinding. And then we um, basically continue this process until we get, um, a consist until we get consistent contours. If it all stays like this, that means that we can probably only combine these two or maybe those three um, measurements uh, because only for those do we have a consistent model, which is of course required for a joint analysis and combined constraints that mean anything. We can always combine those, but the chi-squared will be horrible and we shouldn't interpret the result as cosmology. So let's assume we have consistency. At that point, finally, we can <coughs> combine all our measurements to then also get accurate and precise cosmology measurements. Hopefully that will be the case by about 2024. But um, to summarize, let me just give you one more pie chart. That is my outlook on analysis parameters for cosmology analysis in the 2020s. I believe that about 5% of our parameters will be those that we understand really well. And that's um, cosmology parameters. Then there's another 25% that are related to, um, to uh, sample selection and such where we can maybe uh, make progress uh, with uh, characterizing our detectors and everything. So we can make progress in the lab. And then there's the other 70% that I just call systematics parameters here, uh, which come in two f different flavors. There are observation systematics, which means that they are survey specific. And there are astrophysical systematics, which also means that they are observable and survey specific. And then we can, can use these different dependencies to slice and dice um, the parameter space, um, which is, I think, our only hope to make progress uh, to get us towards the, these 5%. Of course, one could say that these two um, are highly correlated and interrelated, so it's probably 95% systematics, but that really means that, that's what, well, that, that's it. that is what we have to work on right now. And in conclusion, um, so it's clear that the existence of cosmic acceleration requires new fundamental physics, uh, but we are now entering the decade of very large surveys um, across the electromagnetic spectrum and across different measurement techniques, which will allow us to make progress on this. The cosmology constraints um, of most of these will soon be systematically limited, and we will have to use uh, the dependence of the different probes on systematics um, to make progress towards accurate cosmology constraints. First of all, by combining probes to identify and understand systematic effects. And then after we've done though, to maximize um, constraining power once we've gained consistency. And I think my most important point is that precision cosmology requires collaboration across all surveys and wavelengths right now. We have to plan for future analysis that are compatible between the different surveys so that we can actually at the end uh, make progress in this complex parameter space. Thank you. So um, first of all, there's of course the question of um, LST um, and Euclid at about the same time. But I think the nice thing for LST and also for W first later on is that these are experiments that can happen on their own. Because in LST we have multiple bands, so we can get photoses and do an LST only analysis. 
Euclid uh, has a different strategy where it requires um, other ground-based observations to get photosis in the first place. So that's a weird comparison. Um, but of course, they will both learn from each other. Euclid in the sense that they require LCC for their photosis. Um, LCC will learn from Euclid how bad of a problem landing really is. And then W first is currently designed to be fully self-sufficient and uh, to calibrate this matrix to very, very high accuracy. But that survey strategy is still um, under debate. And we should also keep in mind in that comparison that cosmology or imaging cosmology is less than one year, I think, of the total W first duration. So we were comparing very different surveys there. But certainly there will be, be benefits by comparing all of them. Whether that should be at the pixel or, or at the catalog level is still under debate. Yes. I don't see why we can directly say it is a systematic. Yes, I agree with that. I just don't want to put a number on it without carefully combining, but yes, we can say that it will definitely be more than two sigma when you combine those. Okay, fair enough. Do you have any, any suspicion or gut feeling for what might be driving this, if, it, if there is one? So for the weak landing only side, of course, the first thing that people might think about is photosis, but it is also intriguing that, for example, the recent BOSS uh, reanalyses, so galaxy clustering into comparables uh, redshift, we're also low in S8. So uh, we currently have different kinds of measurements of um, <coughs> the amplitude of structure uh, at, at late times that seem to be skewed uh, in the same direction away from Planck. So I'm not sure yet on which side of these measurements the systematic is. There are also some internal um, intriguing, I'm not sure whether we can call it inconsistencies, but some artifacts within Planck, such as low L, high L splits, and some offsets between polarization and temperature, where I'm not really an expert to say what systematics those might be. But uh, it's definitely something that we should look into more carefully. And if all that persists, then it gets really interesting. But it's still a long way to, uh, to get there. I don't know the latest uh, DESI forecasts. They are also typically made in terms of um, Hubble parameter and distances as a function of redshift, uh, which um, then lose a lot of going through the base to at the end project to W, W not, or W not WA um, is not quite uh, advantageous or doesn't show the full power of the survey. For um, Euclid, I think the goal is N percent. I don't exactly know what N currently is. Uh, then the, the systematics are currently being set to be calibrated such that this goal is reached. Um, that's all something that can be debated. But I think uh, saying something like, I don't know, three to five percent definitely, hopefully by the end, once we combine all of them percent level. So you, you prefer to <laughs>
I think that will definitely depend on both which of those collaborations. I cannot talk about Euclid because the European bureaucracy is quite different and um, that's hard to judge from the outside. Uh, at least in LSST, we do make a big effort to protect, protect grad students and identify concrete projects that they can lead so that uh, even if they can't lead a big data analysis before there is data, uh, they will have first author papers or on certain systematics. And in the ES right now, our goal also is that for each a student that is involved in the courses, the core cosmology analysis, that you need at least one paper that we call essential paper that describes some aspect of the cosmology analysis, be it a cal calibration of um, photoses from galaxy clustering, shape measurements, galaxy bias modeling, one of those. So this was uh, one particular forecast with my choice of scale cuts. Um, I think uh, you can write a forecast to get pretty much any number you want, depending on how conservative or how optimistic you want to be. Here, I, for example, went to, I believe, a max of 3,000 for cosmic shear, which is some statement of how well we can control baryonic effects and all the modeling of nonlinearities. Uh, I mean, this was a this was a forecast just uh, uh, to figure out what the error bars will be. And yes, I put in lambda CDM as baseline um, because that is the most accurate model. If I try to go anywhere around there in parameter space, uh, then pushing the uh, analysis code to go uh, into uh, territories with lots of, uh, say, ghost stack energy, that would be um, uh, more difficult and could lead to neurotic instabilities. Yes. Like yeah. How can this, so if, say, if you take the luminosity function at different rates, would that be still consistent with HSC data? Or? This is only HSC weak lensing. All right, so you still would have to explain this other constraint. Yes. Universe is 0.1 on the ladder would be awful. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so I don't think. No. No, this is only the weak lensing. So this is <laughs> only weak lensing from HSC and from DES here. This is also only a weak lensing measurement, not including galaxy clustering, to do an efforts by efforts comparison. <laughs> well, when we get to cherry picking of data, <laughs> all becomes murky. I don't want to get into this on camera. <laughs> <laughs> So for example, for DES, we released our correlation functions and covariances, and uh, the likelihood code is also public. And uh, in SST, definitely there is also um, a, a policy regulating data access for anyone in the US. It might be different in different countries. And the Dark Energy Science Collaboration is also very committed to making all the analysis transparent, including developing basically all our codes on GitHub, mostly in public repositories. <laughs> 